Good morning, everyone. I am tasked to discuss mycology. Fungi are unique. They are considered eukaryotic because they are membrane bound with a nucleus and organelles. Compared to a prokaryotic bacteria, it is composed of a rigid cell wall, which the major polysaccharide is chitin. It also has a polymer of N-acetylglucosamine, glucans and manans, and some has cellulose. Well, bacteria has a peptidoglycan layer. Its cell membrane is made up of ergosterol. This is the target of amphotericin B and nistatin. That's why the duration treatment of antifungal is longer compared to antibacterial treatment. And they don't respond to antibiotics. First, let us discuss with candidiasis. Candidiasis encompasses many clinical syndromes that may be caused by several species of candida. Invasive candidiasis or candidal infection of the blood and other sterile body fluids is the leading cause of infection-related mortality among hospitalized immunocompromised patients. Candida exists in three morphological forms. We have the oval to round blastospores. We have the double-walled chlamydospores. We also have a pseudomycelium, which is a mass of pseudohyphae and represents the tissue phase of candida. Pseudohyphae are filamentous process that elongate from the yeast cell without the cytoplasmic connection of a true hypha. Candida albicans accounts for most human infection, but candida parapsilosis, candida tropicalis, candida crusade, candida lucidinae, candida glabrata, and several other species are commonly isolated from hospitalized children. Candida albicans forms a germ tube when suspended in a rabbit or human serum, incubated for one to two hours. For neonatal candida infection, candida is the most common cause of oral mucous membrane infection or what we call the oral trash and perineal skin infections in young infants. It could also cause the rare presentations, which include a congenital cutaneous candidiasis caused by the ascending infection into the uterus during gestation, and invasive fungal dermatitis, a postnatal skin infection resulting in positive blood cultures. Invasive candidiasis is a common infectious complication in the neonatal intensive care unit because of the improved survival of extremely preterm infants. For the pathogenesis of candidal infection, immunologic immaturity along with an underdeveloped layer of skin need for invasive procedures among preterm infants such as industrial tubes, CNS, central venous catheters, and exposure to broad-spectrum antibiotics place a preterm infants at high risk for invasive candidiasis. Preterm infants are also at high risk for spontaneous intestinal perforations and necrotizing enterocolitis. Both conditions require abdominal surgery and the use of prolonged exposure to broad-spectrum antibiotics and total parenteral nutrition, requiring a replacement of central venous catheter. Each of these factors increases the risk of invasive candidiasis by decreasing the physiologic barriers that protects against invasive infection. The manifestations of neonatal candidiasis vary in severity from oral trash and candida diaper dermatitis to invasive candidiasis that can manifest in overwhelming sepsis. Signs of invasive candidiasis among premature infants are often non-specific and include temperature instability, lethargy, apnea, hypotension, respiratory distress, abdominal distension, and thrombocytopenia. Central nervous system involvement is the most common and accurate described 
as meningoencephalitis. Candida infections involving the CNS often result in abscesses, leading to unremarkable cerebrospinal fluid parameters. Endoptal mitis is an uncommon complication occurring less than 5% of infants with invasive candidiasis. How to diagnose candida infections? Mucocutaneous infections are most often diagnosed by direct clinical examinations. Scrapings of the skin lesions may be examined with a microscope after gram staining or suspension in potassium hydroxide solution. Definitive diagnosis of invasive disease requires histologic demonstration of the fungus in the tissue specimens or recovery of the fungus from normally sterile body fluids. Blood cultures have very low sensitivity for invasive candidiasis. In a study of autopsy-proven candidiasis in adult patients, the sensitivity of multiple blood cultures for detecting single organism was only 28%. That's why blood culture volume should be maximized as much as possible to increase sensitivity. Furthermore, Assessment of infants in the presence of documented candidemia should include ultrasound or computed tomography of the head to evaluate for abscesses, ultrasound of the liver, kidney, and spleen, cardiac echocardiography, ophthalmologic exam, lumbar puncture, and urine culture. These tests are necessary to determine if more than one body system is infected which is commonly the case. When do we give prophylaxis? In neonatal intensive care unit with high incidence of invasive candidiasis should consider prophylaxis with fluconazole in infants less than 1,000 grams birth weight. The dosing would be twice weekly fluconazole at 3 to 6 mg per kilogram per dose that decreases the rate of both colonization with candida species and invasive fungal infections. The treatment. In the absence of systemic manifestation, topical antifungal therapy is the treatment of choice for congenital cutaneous candidiasis in full-term infants. But congenital cutaneous candidiasis in preterm infants can progress to a systemic disease. If this patient develops systemic disease, 21 days of systemic antifungal therapy from the last positive candida culture would be the best. And it should be given basing on the susceptibility testing result of the cultures. This table would tell us the dosing of antifungal agents in infants. A number of infants younger than one year of age studied with reported pharmacokinetic parameters. We have amphotericin B, the exocolate, the lipid complex, the liposomal amphotericin B, fluconazole, mycafungin, caspofungin, and amidulafungin. Oral candidiasis, or what we call the oral trash, is a superficial mucous membrane infection that affects approximately 2 to 5% of normal neonates. Candida albicans is the most commonly isolated species. Oral stress can develop as early as 7 to 10 days of age. The use of oral antibiotics, especially in the first year of life, can lead to recurrent or persistent trash. Characterized by a purely white, Kurdish material visible on the tongue, palate, and buccal mucosa. It is uncommon after one year of age but can occur in older children treated with antibiotics. But if you have a persistent or recurrent trash with no obvious predisposing reason, such as recent antibiotic use, warrants an investigation of an underlying immunodeficiency specifically vertically, vertically transmitted HIV infection or primary congenital genetic immune defect. Diaper dermatitis is the most common infection caused by candida, 
which is described as a confluent erythematous rash with satellite postules. Ungal and periungal infections may be caused by candida, although trichophyton and epidermophyton are more common causes. Candida onychomycosis differs from the tinea infections by its propensity to involve the fingernails and not the toenails, and by the associated paronychia. Candida paronychia often responds to treatment, consisting of keeping the hands dry and using a topical antifungal agent. For ungal candida infection, often requires systemic antifungal therapy. One weekly fluconazole for 4 to 12 months is effective treatment strategy with fairly low toxicity. Vulvovaginitis is a common candida infection of pubertal and postpubertal female patients. Predisposing factors include pregnancy, use of oral contraceptives, and use of oral antibiotics. Prepubertal girls with candida vulvovaginitis usually have predisposing factors such as diabetes mellitus and prolonged antibiotic treatment. Clinical manifestation can include pain or itching, dysuria, vulvar or vaginal erythema, and an opaque white or cheesy exudate. More than 80% of cases are caused by candida albicans. We treat this patient with vulva, candida vulvovaginitis, which either vaginal cream, nistatine, clotrimazole, or meconazole, or oral gluconazole, a single dose, is also effective. Candida albicans is the most common cause of invasive candidiasis among immunocompromised pediatric patients associated with higher rates of mortality and N-organ involvement than are non-albicans species. Or trash again and diaper dermatitis are the most common candida infection in HIV-infected children. Besides oral trash, three other types of oral candida infection can occur in HIV-infected children. We have the atropic candidiasis, chronic hyperplastic candidiasis, and angular colitis. Fungal infections, especially candida and aspergillus infection, are a significant problem in oncology patients with chemotherapy-associated neutropenia. Greater than five days of fever during a neutropenic episode is associated with presence of invasive fungal infection. Accordingly, empirical antifungal therapy should be started if fever and neutropenia persist for more than five days. Fluconazole can be used if the patient is not critically ill and drug is not already being used for prophylaxis. And an equinocandine or liposomal amphotericin B should be used with the, when these conditions are not met. High-risk oncology patients warrant prophylaxis against invasive candida infection. Both fluconazole or an equinocandines are used for these indications. Lower doses are typically used for this purpose than those used for treatment. Bone marrow transplant recipients have a much higher risk of fungal infections because of the dramatically prolonged duration of neutropenia. Voriconazole prophylaxis decreases the incidence of candidemia. In bone marrow transplant recipients with an additional benefit over fluconazole of mold prophylaxis, the use of myelopoietic colonic stimulating factor reduces the duration of neutropenia after chemotherapy and is associated with decreased risk of candidemia. When candida infection occurs in this population, the lung, spleen, kidney, and liver are involved in more than 50% of cases. Solid organ transplant recipients are also at increased risk of for superficial and invasive candida infection. Candida infection studies in liver transplant recipients demonstrate the utility of antifungal prophylaxis with amphotericin B, fluconazole, boriconazole, or caspofingin in high-risk patients, those with prolonged surgical time, comorbidities, recent antibiotic exposure, or bile leak. Central venous catheter infections occur most often in oncology patients 
but can affect any patient with a central catheter. Neutropenia, use of broad spectrum antibiotics, and parenteral alimentation are associated with increased risk for candida central catheter infection. The treatment would be removing or replacing the catheter followed by a 2-3 to three week course of systemic antifungal therapy. Removal of a central catheter in place at the time of positive blood culture and a use of peripheral IV or internal support for at least 48 hours prior to obtaining a central access is advocated. Removal of the original catheter followed by immediate replacement with a new central catheter in a different anatomic location is acceptable in an interval without a central access is not feasible. Chronic mucocutaneous candidiasis involves candida infections of the oral cavity, esophagus, or genital mucosa, as well as involvement of the skin and nails that is recurrent or persistent and difficult to treat. There is a broad spectrum of genetic immune defects associated with chronic mucocutaneous candidiasis, mostly related to severe T cell defects and disorders of interleukin 17 production. Primary immune deficiencies are associated with an increased risk of invasive candidal infections, including severe congenital neutropenia, CARD9 deficiency, chronic granulomatous disease, and leukocyte adhesion deficiency type 1. Diagnosis is often presumpted in neutropenic patients with prolonged fever because of positive blood cultures for candida occur only in a minority of patients who are later found to have disseminated infection. For the treatment, echinocandines are favored as empirical treatment for moderately or severely, severely ill children. Luconazole is acceptable for those who are infected with a susceptible organism and are less critically ill. Amphotericin B products are also acceptable. Definitive antifungal selection should be based on susceptibility testing results. For AMPOV deoxycholate, it is indicated in inactive against approximately 20% strain of Candida lusitaniae. Fluconazole is useful for, for many Candida infection but is inactive against all strains of Candida crusae and 5-25% to of Candida glabrata strains. Another fungus that is worth discussing is Cryptococcus neoformans. Cryptococcosis is an invasive fungal disease caused by a monomorphic encapsulated yeast. Cryptococcus neoformans, var neoformans, is the most common etiologic agent worldwide and is the predominant pathogenic fungal infection among persons infected with HIV. So compared to Cryptococcus gati, it is found in eucalyptus tree. Cryptococcus neoformans is found in the reservoir species in feces, and this is most commonly co common in immunocompromised and AIDS patient. It is an encapsulated yeast-like reproduced by budding and has four serotypes. We have serotype A, neoformans, most common. We have D, neoformans, very relic to a primary cutaneous, and B and C, which is gati or gatai. Cryptococcus neoformans, vast bar neoformans, exist worldwide. And again, this is the most frequently found among old pigeon droppings, isolated in Fort Santiago. And cryptococcus is considered an AIDS defining illness. In most cases, cryptococcus neoformans is acquired by inhalation of fungal spores less than 5 to 10 micrometers, which are engulfed by an alveolar macrophages. Local inoculation leads to cutaneous or ophthalmo ophthalmic infection rarely. An additional portal of entry can be seen with organ transplantation of the infected tissue. Direct entry to the gastrointestinal tract can also occur, but after entry into the body, either latent infection or acute disease is produced. 
Cell mediated immunity is the most important host defense for producing granulomatous inflammation and thus containing cryptococcal infection. Patients with compromised cell mediated immunity is at higher risk of developing cryptococcal disease. So, first, you will have the primary pulmonary infection, majority will be asymptomatic, and the fungus can stay dormant. Some will disseminate with large inoculum, and the CNS is the most common site of dissemination. Pneumonia. Pneumonia is the most common form of cryptococcosis. And disseminated infection occurs after a primary pulmonary disease, especially among immunocompromised patients. Advanced HIV infection is the most common predisposing factor for disseminated cryptococcosis. Meningitis, subacute chronic meningitis, is the most common clinical manifestation of disseminated cryptococcal infection. The clinical presentation is variable and prognostic. Good outcomes are associated with headache as initial symptom, normal mental status, absence of predisposing condition, normal CSF opening pressure, normal CSF glucose, negative injecting stains, absence of intraneural infection by culture and cryptococcal antigen titers in CSF and, and serum of less than 1 is a 32. Overt symptoms of meningitis and HIV infection predict a poor outcome in cryptococcosis of the CNS. To diagnose cryptococcosis, recovery of fungus by culture or demonstration of the fungus in the histologic section or infected tissue is the definitive microscopic examination. We have the positive India ink, there will be a halo. This will show a positive India ink. Then the treatment will depend on the site of involvement and the host of the immune, immune status, the host immune status. The immunocompetent patient with sim asymptomatic or mild disease limited to the lungs may be closely observed without therapy or alternatively treated with an oral fluconazole, pediatric dose of 6 to 12 milligram per kilogram and adult dose of 200 to 400 milligram per day or itraconazole given for 3 to 12 months with a duration dependent on the clinical response. Patients with cryptococcemia or severe symptoms or non-HIV immunocompromised hosts with lung disease with cryptococcal antigen titers of more than 1 is to 8 or with CNS, urinary tract or cutaneous disease should be treated with a stage approach. You should start giving with the induction phase of amphotericin B plus plus cytosine with a minimum of two, me two weeks followed by induction phase of a consolidation phase with oral fluconazole or itraconazole for 6 to 12 months because itraconazole does not penetrate well in the CSF so consolidation therapy for CNS disease should be accomplished with fluconazole Lifelong maintenance therapy may be required for children who remain immunocompromised. Giving a lipid complex amphotericin B is recommended for patients intolerant to the exocolate amphotericin. Although experience with this agent in children with cryptococcosis is limited, the current echinocandines do not have clinical activity against cryptococcal infections. Another worth discussing fungus would be Malassezia. Malassezia include the causative agents of Tinea versicolor, also called Apiteriasis versicolor, and are associated with other dermatologic conditions and with congemia in patients with indwelling catheters. Malassezia species are commensal lipophilic yeast with a predilection for the sebum-rich areas of the skin. They are considered part of the normal skin flora with 
presence established by three to six months of age. As you can see in this figure, a young adult with a tinea versicolor notice the characteristic hypopigmented lesion, hypopigmented scaling macules, the symmetric patterns seen in this patient is not characteristic of all patients with this infection, however, then if you do skin scraping, macroscopically, there is a dry chalky appearance, but microscopic, my favorite cluster of thick walled blastospores, together with hyphae, produce a characteristic spaghetti and meatball appearance, and that is malassezia. Other malassezia species, we have malassezia globosa, malassezia sympodialis, Malassezia ristrica and Malassezia furfur are the major causes of tinea versicolor. For different species, Malassezia sympodialis and Malassezia globosa are implicated in neonatal acne, while Malassezia globosa and Malassezia ristrica are associated with seborrheic dermatitis and dandruff. Malassezia may be isolated from sebum-rich areas of unsymptomatic persons, emphasizing that the demonstration of the fungus does not equate with infection. The traditional primary therapy for tinea versicolor would be a topical selenium sulfide with 2.5%, applied daily for at least 10 minutes for a week, followed by weekly to monthly applications for several months to prevent relapse. Additional topical agents that have efficacy include terbenefine, cotrimazole, and topical azoles. Some will respond with 1% cyclopyrox, ketoconazole, or zinc ferritione shampoos. Aspergillus Aspergillus is a relatively unusual pathogen in that it can create very different disease states depending on the host characteristics including allergies, hypersensitivity, non-invasive, and other, and other diseases with the following etiologic agents. The most common classic invasive diseases are Aspergillus fumigatus and Aspergillus flavus. The most common causing allergic diseases are Aspergillus fumigatus and Aspergillus flavatus. Aspergillus fumigatus accounts for over 90% of all infections. It grows in a wide range of temperatures and thrives up to 50 degrees Celsius, and it is inhibited by cyclohexamide. Usually, aspergillus are found in soil, air, and water storage tanks, in hospitals, in food, or compost, decaying vegetations, beddings, pillows, ventilations, air conditioning system, and computer fans. The mode of transmission are divided into three. We have respiratory, direct inoculation, and ingestion. So for the pathogenesis, you inhale the spores disseminated from humidifiers and air conditioner filters and ducts that have accumulated moisture and from the environment. If you have a very low immune system, then you will see an aspergillinoma from a CT scan of the lung what we call the fungus ball. This is the macroscopic appearance of the fungus ball occupying the large pulmonary cavity. Second pathogenesis is direct inoculation into the subcutaneous tissues, what we call this mycetoma. Some will go to the bloodstream if you are a drug user with a valve, some valve replacement or arterial catheterization. Some through ingestion, eating peanuts with Aspergillus flavus because Aspergillus flavus growing in peanuts and rains produces aflatoxin, one of the most potent toxins known, which can cause food poisoning. And to diagnose, we will see the fun like pattern or broom like pattern of the aspergillus. The treatment for allergic aspergillosis would be corticosteroids and intraconazole 
for invasive aspergillosis, we have amphotericin B and itraconazole. For the aspergilloma or the fungus ball, we do lobectomy and amphotericin B treatment. Histoplasmosis or histoplasma capsulatum. It is a dimorphic fungus found in the environment as a saprophyte in the mycelial mold form and in tissues in the parasitic form as yeast. Histoplasmosis is an intracellular mycotic infection of the reticular endothelial cells. It is caused by inhalation of the conidia from the fungus Histoplasma capsulatum. The disease mainly affects the lungs, with most patients often showing minimal or no symptoms at all. It has two varieties. We have the Histoplasma capsulatum var capsulatum. We also have the Histoplasma capsulatum var dubosier. Capsulatum will involve the lung. Some will have subclinical pulmonary type, which will heal, leaving calcification in the lungs like pulmonary tuberculosis. If you do a biopsy, you will see a histocytes. Well, histoplasma capsula, capsulatum var dubosier will show giant cells. The pathogenesis, inhalation of microconidia fungus spores in the initial stage of human infection, the conidia will reach the alveoli, germinates, and proliferate as a yeast. While the reservoir would be the soil contaminated with bird or bud droppings. So after inhalation, the histoplasma spores will go to the lungs. Then this will form as the initial pulmonary lesion ages. This will, will be giant cell formation followed by formi formation of cachetion granuloma and central necrosis then again they will have relapse then the cell mediated immunity then this will, this will disseminate it to other organs in the acute phase majority have no symptoms or flu-like symptoms the in the chronic phase some would occur in those who are immunocompromised and they will resemble like pulmonary tuberculosis so histoplasmosis is the fungus is not easily detected by direct mycological examination of organic secretions. So the fungus can be isolated from sputum or tracheal bronchial secretion in 60 to 85 percent of cases. So laboratory diagnosis, you will see a tuberculate macroconidia. Please take note of the tuberculate macroconidia. The treatment would be if there is mild and symptomatic no antifungal therapy is needed but in infants progressive disseminated histoplasmosis we give amphotericin b as a drug of choice another fungus blastomycosis blastomyces dermatitidis blastomycosis is a rare fungal infection caused by the fungus blastomyces dermatitidis which grows in the wood and soil it is a common infection among dogs and in endemic areas. There could also be an acute or chronic infection of the lung, the skin, the bone, and the genital urinary tract. For the pathogenesis, the ability of the mycelial fragments and spores to convert to yeast in the lung is a crucial event in the pathogenesis of infection by the blastomycosis dermatitis. Again, it would start an inhalation of the airborne conidia after disturbance of the contaminated soil. The reservoir usually is the most moist soil in which with the decomposing organic debris, which will infect humans and rarely transmitted from human to human or another human to animal. Some of the patients, again, there are in the acute phase, most of the time they're asymptomatic. If they will present asymptomatic, there will be usually bacterial pneumonia, but again, it will solve it spontaneously even without treatment. But some will have chronic pulmonary disease and some will develop into progressive ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome. And here are the different extrapulmonary blastomycosis. So to diagnose them, usually you will see in a microscopic exam, a yeast cell, but is attached to the parent cell by a broad base. And it 
If you do a culture, it will require 5 days to 4 weeks for growth and can be as short as 2 to 3 days. And what is unique in blastomycosis? All patients should be treated. And antifungal therapy is influenced by the severity of the infection and the involvement of CNS, the integrity of the host immune system, and pregnancy. All patients diagnosed with Blastomycosis should receive antifungal therapy. Newborns with blastomycosis should be treated with Ampotericin B deoxycholate. Children with mild to moderate severe infection can be treated with itraconazole at 10 mg per kilogram per day for 6 to 12 months. But children with severe disease or immunocompromised should be given Ampotericin B for 7 to 14 days followed by itraconazole for a total of 12 months. For CNS, blastomycosis, we give a lipoid or lipid complex ampotericin B for 4 to 6 weeks, six weeks followed by itraconazole or fluconazole or voriconazole with a duration of more than or equal to 12 months. Coxidioidomycosis. Coxidioidomycosis, also known as valley fever, and San Joaquin fever, desert rheumatism, coccidioidal granuloma. This is caused by coccidioides species growing in the environment as spore bearing, atroconidia bearing mycelial forms. And in their parasitic form, they appear as unique endorosporulating spherules in infected tissue. We have two Recognized species, we have the Coccidioides imitis found in California, San Joaquin Valley region. In USA and Southern America or Mexico, we, we have the Coccidioidomycosis posadaceae. Posadaci. For the pathogenesis, inhale spores to reach the terminal bronchioles where they transform into septated spherules that resist phagocytosis and within which many endospore develops, release in the spores transform into new spherules and process results in an acute focus of infection. In the spores could disseminate lymphohematogenously and there will be granulomatous reaction predominates. Then children with congenital primary immunodeficiency disorders may be at increased risk of infection. So there will be also a pulmonal Pulmonary and extrapulmonary disease. Pulmonary infection accounts for 95% of cases. For the primary infection, majority are symptomatic. Some will present like other fungal infection as influenza-like illness. There will be full recovery. But for primary pulmonary coccidioidomycosis, it will go to the lung as a spirule showing a right lobe consolidation. The appearance is non-specific and could be produced by other pathogens as well. In secondary infection, this may develop chronic pulmonary infection or widespread disseminated infection. So the high-risk population are Amer African American, Asian and Filipino descents, pregnant women and immunocompromised persons. So we Filipinos are predisposed to coccidioidomycosis infection. Please take note. The x-ray will show a solid, solitary lung nodule in chronic pulmonary disease. If you do a biopsy or histopathology of the specimen, you will see here a mature spherule, mature spherule with endospores inside. This is coccidioides imitis. The treatment, it will vary. If you have an acute pneumonia, mild, you have to observe or without antifungal treatment for one to three months interval for more than one year of age. Some experts will recommend antifungal treatment. For other patients, they give antifungal treatment usually with azole, fluconazole, ketoconazole, voriconazole for daily for three to six months up to intervals for more than one year of age. Paracoxidioidomycosis. 
Father's Coxillo de Mycosis, or what we call the Southern American or Brazilian Blastomycosis, or what we call the loose splendor almedia disease, is an uncommon fungal infection endemic in South America with cases reported in Central America and Mexico. Brazil accounts for more than 80% of all reported cases. The etiologic agent, Paracoxidioides basiliensis, is a thermally, thermally dimorphic fungi found in the environment, in the mycelial mold form, and in the tissues as yeast. They will present as ulcerative granulomata of the buccal, nasal, skin, and adrenal glands. For the pathogenesis, again, like any other fungal infection, it will be inhalation spores, it will go to the pulmonary, to the lungs, manifesting a primary, primary pulmonary infection. Majority will have a benign disease, some will have acute to progressive chronic disease, some would have mucocutaneous lymph, lymphonodular and disseminated. For the diagnosis, in culture, they will be mold at 25 degrees and they will conversion to the typical yeast form by growth at 35 to 37 degrees. And histopathology, what is cute about paracoxidioidomycosis, you have here the body cells of paracoxidioides basiliensis. For the treatment, we have itroconazole orally for six months is the treatment of choice. Some will give fluconazole, for, but the doses are higher. In severe cases, we also give amphotericin B and in vitro, they have noted that amphotericin in vitro, they have used to give interbenefine and allylamine with a potent in vitro activity against P. brasiliensis and has been used for successful treatment of paracoxidioidomycosis and responsive to treatment with trimethylene cot sulfamethoxazole. Two therapies currently under investigation it include the use of curcumin, an antioxidant found in the Indian spice turmeric, and the calcineurin inhibitor cyclosporine curcumin was found to have more antifungal activity than fluconazole against P. brasiliensis when studied in vitro or outside the body using a human buccal epithelial cells. Cyclosphyrin blocks the thermodimorphism of P. P brasiliensis in in vitro and other investi under investigational drugs. My favorite fungi, the sporotrichosis, the flower-like fungi, what we call the sporotrix shankai. Sporotrix shankai is a rare fungal fungus that occurs worldwide, both sporadically and in outbreaks. This is what we call the rose gardener disease caused by sporotic shankai found in plants and in soil as rose turns. It will manifest as separating subcutaneous nodules which progresses proximally along lymphatic channels treated by itraconazole. So you will see a flower like fungus on microscopy. Cutaneous sporotrichosis is the most common form of the disease in all age group. And it could be lymphocutaneous or fixed cutaneous and former being much more common. For the lymphocutaneous, it occurs in 75% of patients. It usually occurs after traumatic subcutaneous inoculation. Often, often with prolonged incubation period of 1 to 12 weeks, an isolated painless erythematous papule develops at the inoculation site, so they call it rose gardener disease. After initial lesion, usually in adults, it's in the extremity, in children in the face, the papule will enlarge and ulcerate, then satellite lesions will follow the lymphangetic spread, there will be multiple tender subcutaneous nodules tracking along the lymphatic channels that train the lesion. Then there will be secondary nodules. Then they will ulcerate and will not heal spontaneously and could persist for years if they are untreated. For the cutaneous sporotrichosis, the 
The definitive diagnosis would be isolation of the fungus from the site infection. We will do special histologic staining. Then the treatment will be itraconazole in younger children with cutaneous disease would benefit from potassium iodide given orally once daily, beginning at 5 to 10 reps three times a day. Then you will increase the dose. For cutaneous portrachosis, the treatment would be amphotericin B, especially if there will be involvement of pulmonary or disseminated infections or in patients with immunocompromised conditions. Zygomycosis, or what you call the mycormycosis. Zygomycosis refers to a group of orogenistic infections caused by dimorphic fungi and the class Zygomycetes, which are primitive fast-growing fungi that are largely saprophytic and ubiquitous. These organisms are found commonly in soil, in decaying plant and in animal matter, and on moldy cheese, fruit, and bread. So, sa mga bread, careful. We have this infection caused by rhizopus, um, rhizomycore, and absidia. They have three clinical, four clinical forms. They could Manifest as rhinocerebellar or rhino orbital. They could also be pulmonary or GI and skin. For the laboratory diagnosis, usually we do skin scrapings of cutaneous lesion. Uh, we, for the pulmonary infection, we have sputum or needle biopsies. We do nasal discharges, scraping, aspirate, and biopsy for disseminated infections. And what we sh see is the cute, broad, Irregularly shaped, non septated hyphae with a right angular branching. So, lollipop appearance of the sporangium. You see um, them on the lacto panel cotton blue, mount of to identify the zygomycosis, and we treat them giving amphotericin B. Pneumocystis gerevisi or pneumocystis carinae. Pneumocystis gerevisi pneumonia or interstitial plasma pneumonitis is an, in an immunocompromised person is a life-threatening infection. It is a common extracellular parasite found all over the world in the lungs of mammals. The taxonomic placement of this organism has not been unequivocally established. Both nucleic acid homologs place it closest to fungi, despite sharing morphologic features and drug susceptibility with protozoa. Detailed studies of the basic biology of the organism are not possible because of the inability to maintain pneumocystis gerevisi in the culture. The phenotypic and genotypic analysis demonstrate that each mammalian species is infected by a unique strain or possibly species of pneumocystis. So that's why sometimes they are confused is pneumocystis is really a fungi or a really a bacteria. The organism is found with three distinct morphologic stages. We have the trophozoite stage, sporozoite, and a cystic. For the pathogenesis, the two forms of pneumocystis gerevisi are found in the alveolar spaces. We have the cyst, which is 5 to 8 micrometer in diameter and we also have the extracystic trophozoites then this trophozoite will go to the attaches to the type 1 alveolar epithelial cells then later it will provoke the CD4 cells in controlling infection of pneumocystis gerevisi in the absence of adaptive immune response as can be modeled in severe combined immune deficiency in mice infection of pneumocystis gerevisi produces a life little alteration in the lung histology but there is a rapid onset of inflammatory response that results in an intense cellular infiltrate marked by reduced lung compliance and significant hypoxia which impairs gas exchange then, these inflammatory changes are also associated with marked disruption of surfactant function. Thus, there will be a lung injury, 
predisposing to an ARDS, that's why we call them PCP, pneumocystis carinae pneumonia. So in laboratory, the X-ray will be non-specific. It will only show dense infiltrates in both lungs. Then microscopically, it is very hard to diagnose them, and it requires a spatial staining, what we call the silver methanamine staining, and we need a bronchoalveolar lavage or transbronchial biopsy, and this is considered the gold standard for diagnosis of pneumocystis jurevisi. The recommended treatment for pneumocystis jurevisi pneumonia is trimethoprim sulfamethoxazone a 15 to 20 trimethoprim dose and 75 to 100 milligram sulfamethoxazole dose administered IV or orally if there is mild disease or no malabsorption or diarrhea. Some will give pentamidine acetionate or atovacone. Other effective therapy would be trimethoxate glucuronate or trimethoprim plus dapsone or clindamycin plus plumacine. The most severe complication of pneumocystis jurevisi pneumonia is adult type respiratory distress syndrome and without treatment, pneumocystis jurevisi pneumonitis is fatal in almost all immunocompromised patients within 3-4 to four weeks of onset. Um, this table will show you the summarized fungus that I have discussed. So if we have the histoplasma capsulatum, in Masilia form, you will see a tuberculate macroconidia, and in this form, we have the narrow base cell. If you have the coccidioides imitis, the mesial form will show us the atoconidia, but if you will see a tissue biopsy in yeast form, you will have a spherule with endospores. Black blastomyces dermatitis will show us a white base cell, while paracoccidioides will show us a multiple body yeast cell or the stealing will appearance. I'll be discussing about antifungal treatment. For the antifungal treatment, Amphotericin B is the prototype of the oldest antifungal class. Amphotericin B was once the preferred treatment for invasive fungal infection as well as the standard comparison for all newer antifungal agents. Amphotericin B is named because it is amphoteric forming soluble salts in both acidic and basic environment. However, because of its insolubility in water, amphotericin B for clinical use is actually amphotericin B mixed with the detergent deoxycholate. The fungicidal activity is the result of the damaged barrier and subsequent cell death through leakage of essential nutrients from the fungal cell. So, this is the drug of choice of serious infection, including disseminated. So, kung disseminated infection, severe infection, the drug of choice is amphotericin. So, the side effect is shake and bake. Patient will manifest with fever, chills, nausea, vomiting, local plebitis. Kusung ni siya maka plebitis, amphotericin. Renal insufficiency, electrolyte imbalance, flushing, and muscle and joint pains. Another antifungal is the mesatin with the brand names of Afongina, Mycostat, Mycostatin, Mycosil, Orastin, Stanis. This is only used for mucocutaneous candidiasis or what we call the oral candidiasis. It is not effective against dermatophytes and not well absorbed from the GI tract. The solution, the dosing would be oral suspension, 100,000 unit per ml. We swish and swallow with a side effect of GI distress. Imidazole and triazoles. The mechanism of action will be interfered with the cell membrane synthesis of, by in, inhibition of cytochrome P450 dependent 14 alpha demethylase. They also may impair fungal triglyceride phospholipid synthesis and inhibit fungal oxidative peroxidase enzymes. Here are the imidazoles or the azoles. We have the fluconazole, boriconazole. I guess you've heard of ketoconazole or the nizoral. We have the clotrimazole and the posoconazole. Itroconazole with the brand name is Poranox. 
They are effective against dermatophytes, blastomycosis, histoplasmosis, aspergillosis, poor trichosis, cryptococcosis, candidiasis, coccidioidomycosis, paracoccidioidomycosis, penicillium, theo, hyphomycosis. But you have to take note that Fusarium solani is resistant to all azoles and fluconazole has no activity against aspergillus. For the allyl amines and benzyl amine, the mechanism of action will be inter interference of the cell membrane synthesis by inhib inhibition of the escoline epoxidase. So we have the terbenafine ointment or the lamisil ointment, which is the drug of choice for dermatophytes and poor activity against many cells. We also have the butinafine or the punseed cream, which is currently not available. It is seen as terbenafine but also effective against aspergillae and dimorphic fungi, including scorchic shankai. And we have the pyrimidine, the mechanism of action. It will target the nucleic acid synthesis, early RNA chain termination, and interruption of DNA synthesis. For the pyrimidine, we have the flu cyt 5 flu cytosine. This is not available in our country. Brand name Ancuban. It is a very extremely narrow antifungal spectrum limited to Candida and Cryptococcus and should never be given as a monotherapy because of their emergence of resistance. That's why Amphotericin B plus a 5 flu cytosine during the induction phase is usually given in patients with aspergillosis or invasive or severe infection. Another antifungal worth discussing, I guess you've heard about grishofulvin. Grishofulvin with a mechanism of action of inhibition of fungal mitosis by interacting with the microtubules. We have the grishofulvin tablet. It is fungistatic against dermatophytes and it has no activity against candida and malassezia. We have the caspofungin with the brandy cancidas effective in invasive aspergillosis in patients refractory to or intolerant to other antifungals and also effective against candida species. So we give it a slow infusion for aspergillus infection. We have mycofungin. Mycofungin with the brand name Mycamin. It is effective in candida and aspergillus species. It is given as prophylaxis for candida infection in hematopoietic stem cell transplant patients and esophageal, esophageal candidiasis. And it is given for prophylaxis for esophageal candidiasis of 150 mg IV daily. And we also have anid the anidulafungin. It is given as a drug of choice for candida aspergillus species, esophageal candidiasis, intradomal candida, and peritonitis with side effect of liver toxicity, diarrhea, hypokalemia, and infusion reactions. For other miscellaneous agent, again worth discussing, is tolnaftate. It is a type carbamate that interferes with the cell membrane synthesis via inhibition of escoline epoxidase, similar to allyl amines, with the brand name of tynactin and tolnaderm. It is used since this is usually an ointment or a cream. It is given as a treatment for dermatophytes and tinea versicolor for treatment duration of 2 to 6 weeks. Another is cyclopyroxolamine with a mechanism of action of hydroxypyridone that chelates polyvalent cations that have important functions in fungal cytochromes, catalases, and peroxidases. This is usually given as a liquid shampoo as a treatment for sub subderm and control of tinea capitis, side effect, irritations. And we have the common selenium sulfide. I guess you have heard, selenium blue shampoo. Salsan blue shampoo or selenium sulfide with a mechanism of action. It reduces cellular adhesion into the stratum corneum, facilitating shedding of the fungi and antimitotic properties. Salsan blue, um, usually, there will be scaling, flaking, and itching of the scalp due to Dunbrock and seborrheic dermatitis. You usually lather and massage the shampoo with a side effect of irritation. That's all. Thank you.